Imagine this. You're a dwarf in the chamber of Marzabul. There's drums in the deep, pounding at the doors, and there's no way out. Lord Balin is dead, alongside many other dwarves of your brave expedition. And now you know that these will be your final moments. Just as the orcs break through, you have one last single thought. Was coming to Moria a mistake? Wisdom is one of the greatest virtues that you can have in Middle-earth, and life in general. It allows you to make decisions based off lots of deliberation, the weighing of the possible benefits and the possible consequences, and ultimately whether it will all be worth it. When Balin made the decision to attempt to recolonize Moria, one should question the wisdom behind that decision, and whether or not that Balin's decision was not based on the deliberation of facts, but rather a combination of pride, greed, and overconfidence. Pride, greed, and overconfidence that would eventually result in his death alongside his entire loyal following of dwarves within his fledgling colony. In this video, I'm going to argue something, that Balin's colony was doomed from the start, that Balin and all of those dwarves were doomed the moment that Balin decided to adopt the idea, that idea to take back Moria, and recolonize it in the name of the dwarves. I know this isn't exactly a controversial take, and I imagine that a lot of people would agree with this. Nevertheless, whether you agree with me or disagree with me, I hope you take the time to watch this video. We need to start with a brief history of Balin's colony, just so you guys know what I'm talking about. And don't worry, I'll go into further depth later in the video. Our story begins, as spoken by Gloin, shortly after the dwarves retake Erebor from Smaug. And despite their great victory, a shadow of disquiet falls across Durin's folk. There are whispers that the dwarves are too hemmed in, that great wealth and power await in the wider world if they only reach out for it. The name and focus is khazad the ancient city of Durin's folk, and the whispers say that they now have the strength to reclaim the city. It's unknown where these whispers originated from, and I'm going to talk about a potential conspiracy later in the video. But what matters is that a certain dwarf, Balin, listens to these whispers. Balin is a very respected, influential dwarf. He played a major role in the quest for Erebor, resulting in him becoming extremely wealthy. He was also a cousin of King Dane II Ironfoot, and of course was a descendant of Durin himself. He was the one who gave physical form to these whispers, resolving to go to Moria and reclaim the ancient city. In this, he gathered himself a following of many dwarves, including Ori and Oin, also of the quest for Erebor. And although King Dane did not approve of the plan, he reluctantly gave them permission to leave. The rest we know comes from the remnants of the Book of Marzabul, written by Ori. In 2989 of the Third Age, almost 30 years before the War of the Ring, Balin's expedition arrives in the Dimril Dale, outside of Moria's East Gate. They fight a battle there, driving the orcs from Moria and killing many of them in the sunlight. They retake some of the eastern and northern parts of the city, setting up their main base in the 21st Hall, whilst Balin establishes his throne in the chamber of Marzabul. He styles himself the Lord of Moria. For five years, the dwarves slowly unearth the secrets of their lost city. They recover Durin's axe, and possibly his helm. They discover True Silver, also known as Mithril, but it is unclear whether they mined any of their own. Oin also explores westward in an attempt to reach the west gate of Moria, the Holland Gate. During these years, messages are exchanged between Balin and Erebor, and to the Dwarves of Erebor, everything in Moria seems to be going well. This comes to an end in 2994. Whilst looking into the mirror mirror outside the East Gate, Balin is assassinated by an orc. This orc is killed, but it turns out only to be a scout of a much rather group of orcs coming up the Silver Lode. They attack Moria, and although Dwarves bar the gates, the orcs eventually break through. Despite their valiant defense, the Dwarves are slowly pushed backwards, losing the first hall, the bridge of khazad and the second hall. At some point during this defense, Oin and a group of dwarves attempt to flee out the west gate, only to be attacked by the Watcher in the water. Oin is killed, and only four of his group return. The remaining dwarves eventually lose the 21st hall, and make their final stand in the chamber of Marzabul, where Balin has been buried. As Ori scribbles down his final notes, the orcs break through, and Balin's colony is wiped out to the last man. When the messages from Balin's colony cease, the dwarves of Erebor grow concerned, and end up fearing the worst. Despite their suspicions, the demise of Balin's colony is only confirmed when the Fellowship pass through Moria after their attempt to cross the Red Horn Gate is foiled by Karadras. That's almost 30 years later. So there we have it, summarized. The dwarves take Moria, hold it for five years, but are eventually slain to the last man when the orcs counterattack. But hold on, I'm arguing that Balin's colony was doomed from the very beginning. How could they have been doomed from the beginning if they managed to actually capture Moria? and even begin to rediscover old riches in their ancient city? Well, let me tell you. Obviously, just because a cause finds some success, it doesn't mean that it wasn't doomed from the start. The measure of whether something is a failure or success comes from the end result most of the time, 
and Balan's colony was obviously a failure. After all, everyone died. Not exactly any room for success there. The reality is that Balan's colony faced insurmountable odds even before they set out from Erebor, both internal factors as well as external factors outside of their control. The first and foremost of these internal factors is support. Now whilst Balan did amass a following, and more than likely had the funds to back such an expedition, he lacked something very important, support from King Dane. Now remember, King Dane had briefly peered beyond the gate at the end of the Battle of Azanel Bazaar, and had felt the presence of Durin's Bane. He had strongly advised King Vrain II to not attempt to reclaim the city, arguing that a greater power would have to deal with the annoying nuisance of a Balrog of Morgoth before the dwarves could even try. It's almost certain that he retained these beliefs into his old age, which is why he was so reluctant on allowing Balin to go. In other words, once Balin's expedition leaves, they are on their own. Dane will not give them any official support, be that reinforcements or supplies, meaning that any losses or setbacks will be extremely difficult to recover from. Proof of this is the fact that even when the colony goes silent, Dane doesn't send anyone to check on the colony. There are no scheduled detachments of reinforcements or supplies because the only correspondence between Dane and his uppity cousin were messages sent by Balin. Okay, so Balin is on his own. What's the next problem? Manpower. The only official description we have of the size of Balin's expedition comes from Gloin, where he uses the word many. Yeah, real helpful Gloin. Many was one of Tolkien's favourite words, but alas it's a rather useless description without any context. Tolkien mentions that Boromir and Aragorn slew many orcs in the Battle of the Chamber of Mars Bull, but the total death count of the orcs only reaches 14. So how much is many? So we have to look at the situation logically using any hints the text gives us. We can probably assume the expedition was at least in the low hundreds, any less than that and I doubt they could have taken Moria or begun any great works there. And to call yourself the Lord of Moria, well, you'd hope you have more than several dozen subjects or the title comes across as a little pompous. But what's the upper limit? This is a little trickier. The dwarves didn't have a massive population at this point in time, having only reclaimed their homeland a little less than 50 years earlier. There's also the fact that Balan's colony only really established themselves in the eastern and northern parts of the city. Their main base was in the 21st Hall, a mere several hours from the eastern gate. So their expedition was only large enough to take and hold a limited amount of the city. In the Book of Marzabul, Ori writes the names of individual dwarves that are killed during the colony's retreat. This could mean that the colony was small enough that these individual deaths really stood out. However, it could also mean that these dwarves were high ranking or perhaps they were Ori's friends, which is why they were mentioned. The biggest bit of evidence we have to suggest the colony size is the number of orcs that occupied Moria after the colony's destruction. Considering the fellowship passed through Moria for the better part of two days before being discovered, that they drove off the orcs at Marzabul after slaying 14 of them, and that the orcs that pursued them into Lothlorien and Rohan numbered only in the low hundreds suggests that the Moria orcs were not particularly numerous. This is also during the time when the mountain orcs have been severely depleted from the War of the Dwarves and Orcs, and the Battle of the Five Armies. Thus, it seems unlikely that the mountain orcs assembled a large army to deal with Balan's dwarves, but that their force was at least large enough to destroy them, probably taking heavy casualties in the process. Considering the fighting capabilities of Dwarves, the Orcish forces must have been at least several times the size of the Dwarvish colony. If we're putting the Orcish force in the low thousands, maybe 5,000 as a maximum, then Balan's colony probably only numbered somewhere between 300 to 700 Dwarves. Enough to put up a fight, but ultimately not enough to win. This is of course all guesswork, however it does seem likely to me that Balan's colony probably numbered less than a thousand. But let's talk the important part of the manpower discussion. Any loss that Balan's colony takes is irreplaceable. Whether that is during the initial taking of Moria, losses during the exploration of Moria, or losses as a result of accidents, every loss hurts. There's no reinforcements coming, and the colony isn't around long enough for birth rates to be even remotely relevant to the discussion. So realistically, the loss of even a single dwarf hurts Balan's colony. And even though the hostile mountain orcs aren't large in numbers themselves, they can replace the losses far easier than Balan's dwarves. In other words, Balan's colony starts off small, and it was only going to get smaller as time went on. So low, irreplaceable manpower, no official support, what else stacks the odds against Balan? A little problem called isolation. Yes, if Balan got into trouble, he would have no friends nearby to help him. The enmity between the Dwarves and the Galadrim means that no help would come from Lothlorien. Further north, we have the Beornings and the Men of the Vales of Anduin. The Beornings don't particularly like the Dwarves, and the Men of the Vales of Anduin aren't really an organised force. On the western side of Moria lives, well, nobody. 
and everyone else is too far away to help should things turn sour. What this means is that Balan's colony was entirely relying on themselves, as well as good fortune. They had no allies, no exit strategy, no plan B, it was a ride or die scenario. If Balan's colony had been in the Grey Mountains, they would be in range for the Dwarves of Erebor to help. But the huge distance between them and their reliable allies meant that the Dwarves of Balan's colony were completely isolated, on their own, in a place with only one route of escape. And guess what? Balan's colony is attacked, their one escape route is cut off, and no one is nearby to help them. And everyone ends up wondering for 30 years about what actually happened to them. Alright, so how's the prospects of the expedition looking at this point? Low, irreplaceable numbers, no official support, and an isolated, hard to reach location. These are very bad prospects, but if there's no enemies around, what do you have to worry about? Oh wait, there are enemies. Orcs. Lots of them. So I've already mentioned that the Orcs of the Misty Mountains were severely depleted at this point in time, but they are still a threat, at least if you live nearby or are travelling through the mountains. Fortunately, Orcs often squabble with each other, and they only unite if there is someone or something that unites them. Like an expedition of Dwarves taking one of their mountain strongholds. Yep, that might do it. Because Orcs hate Dwarves, and they hate Dwarves in their mountains especially more. So what does this mean for Balan's colony? You've managed to capture Moria, but you've got enemies to the north and south, above you and below you. You don't have the means to destroy them, and you don't have the means to entirely defend your new settlement. What does this mean? Ticking time bomb. As proven by what actually happened, the Orcs would only tolerate the presence of Balan's colony for so long. Basically, as much time as they needed to gather a force to eradicate their new bearded neighbours. In other words, Balan's colony would exist for only as long as the Orcs would allow it. And even if their first assault failed, they could simply wait and gather more. Balan's colony would be forced to either flee or suffer a second assault. A second assault that they could definitely not stand against. But we're missing something obvious here, something that renders this whole discussion academic. The Balrog in the room. Yes, the Balrog is around at this point, and is the chief reason why Dane Ironfoot does not want to go to Moria. What's interesting about this is that we don't have any record of Balan's colony interacting with the Balrog for five whole years. That's a lot of time for a large flaming demon to not notice that the residents of his city suddenly look a lot different. What this could mean is that the Balrog was in a state of hibernation somewhere, or it was venturing in the extreme lower levels of the city, or even beneath the city. Wherever it was, or whatever it was doing, it was occupied for long enough for Balan's colony to exist for five years without running into trouble. At least from what we know, there's a lot of pages missing from the Book of Marzabul where they could have run into the Balrog. How they survived, well, that's another matter. But that's just another time bomb. There is some powerful primeval being in your city, and the moment he notices you, it's game over, no matter what you do. So whether it's the relatively mundane threat of orcs, or the catastrophic threat of the Balrog, it still points to one conclusion. The five years of peace in Balan's colony was essentially an illusion. The dwarves were at both the mercy of the orcs and the Balrog, and it was just a matter of who struck first. In the case of reality, it was the lesser threat of the orcs, but even they were enough to completely destroy the colony. So let's summarize this. You're Balan looking over your chances of success. You're traveling to Moria to retake the ancient dwarven city, far away from Erebor and any help. Dane is allowing you to go, but is refusing to give you support, and you probably only have a thousand dwarves at most, and you will receive no more. The Misty Mountains are filled with orcs, and of course, there is the legend of Durin's Bane, which Dane claims still walks in the city. To us, not looking good. But to Balan, for some reason, it was worth the risk. The reality is that Balan could have never held Moria. In fact, he did well enough just to take it. With so many moving pieces on the board, with so many factors outside of their control, the Dwarves of Balan's expedition were totally at the mercy of other forces, and their limited success had very little to do with their own efforts. It's just another example of how pride and arrogance can lead to the downfall of a person. But hold up, I have something else to say. What if Balan was tricked into going to Moria? What if someone wanted the Dwarves to attempt to retake Moria in an attempt to weaken them? Let's go back to the start for a moment. Floyn mentions that Balan fell victim to whispers. Keep in mind that this was not Balan's idea. Whispers that said this. It is now many years ago that the shadow of the Squire fell upon our people. Once it came, we did not at first perceive. Words began to be whispered in secret. It was said that we were hemmed in a narrow place, and that greater wealth and splendor would be found in a wider world. Some spoke of Moria, the mighty works of our fathers that are in our own tongue called khazad and they declared that we at last had the power and numbers to return. Words began to be whispered in secret, an ominous start. And these whispers are playing on two things. The first is fear, 
the dwarven fear of being trapped in one place, having all of their eggs in the one Erebor basket where if anything goes wrong, they're back to being homeless beggars. And the second is greed, taking advantage of the famous dwarven greed by mentioning that Moria is still there to be reclaimed, along with the great riches and wonders it beholds. Did these whispers simply come from discontent dwarves? Or did they come from someone with malevolent motives? Someone like Sauron, perhaps? Okay, you might now wonder, why would Sauron want the dwarves to try and reclaim Moria? The answer is because he knows they will fail. Sauron and Gandalf both had a great interest in Erebor. Its strategic position leaves it as a gateway to the northern lands. And this is why Gandalf was desperate to get rid of Smaug and rehome Durin's folk. This is why Sauron attempts to treat with the dwarves of Erebor before the War of the Ring. He knows Erebor will not be easy to take, and buying the dwarves neutrality would essentially gift him the northern lands. But Sauron is no stranger to subterfuge, and perhaps several decades earlier he was trying to find another way to weaken or remove the dwarves, tempting them with Moria. Whispers said by those who are secretly in service to Sauron, of which there are many, spoken to the right people might just spread like a wildfire. And all it takes is one dwarf like Balin to listen, and suddenly those whispers are taking reality. Apart from ominous whispers, what other evidence is there that Sauron could be behind Balin's unfortunate expedition? Nothing really conclusive, just circumstantial evidence. The first is a little weak. Why would the dwarves suddenly try to retake Moria now? They've been more powerful in the past, during their kingdoms in the Grey Mountains, and during Thor's reign as King Under the Mountain. Why would they suddenly think they're capable when they haven't even had a single generation's worth of time to savor their new home? Why would they suddenly think to try when war is on the horizon? A war that a certain person is planning on starting very soon, and would very much like to see his enemies weakened first. The second bit of evidence is a little bit more solid. During the Battle of the Chamber of Marzabul, Gandalf spots Black Uruks from Mordor. Now we know Sauron has sent minions into the Misty Mountains before, but considering the Orcs of Moria were pretty much wiped out twice in the last few centuries, then these Black Uruks must be relatively new arrivals. Were they the ones that led the attack on Balan's colony? Was this all part of Sauron's plan? Bathe as many dwarves as he can into Moria, trap them, and then wipe them out? Far-fetched. Maybe a little. But possible? I'd certainly think so. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, or at least found it interesting. I know this is a very long video, so I applaud you if you made it to the end. I'd like to do more videos like this, where I deep dive into certain characters or certain events. In fact, I'd like to do lots of videos on lots of things, but time is a cruel mistress. Let me know what you think of my theory in the comments below, cheers, and remember, don't be a founding colonist. Wait until a colony has survived for a while, wait until everyone else has done all the hard work, and then maybe you can jump ship.